Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Jenny Conley, and I am the executive assistant with Roots and Branches, and we're welcoming you to Daylily Secrets. Um, Roots and Branches, I don't know if any of you are aware of it. I'm sure lots of you are. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to improve the natural environment of Greater West Bend. We accomplish this uh, through our programs, like our Arbor Day School Program, the Clean Up Green Up, and of course our seminars. While our seminars are free and open to the public, uh, they are not free for us. We do not receive tax dollars, or we do not receive tax dollars, and seek support in the community from the individuals, businesses, foundations, and we host three fundraising events throughout the year: our garden party, garden tour, and plant sale. And I'm sure you've kind of been seeing a lot of the pictures of these events. We hope you'll enjoy join us sometime throughout the year at one of these events and help us fundraise for the year. We also want to take a moment and we're going to pass around a clipboard to have you give your suggestions on what kind of seminars you would like to hear in the future. So I'll do that when I'm done. And then we're going to introduce Mr. Nate Bremer of Solaris Farms. Uh, he is a hybridizer specializing in northern hardy daylilies and peonies. He owns and operates Solaris Farms, a century old uh, farmstead located near Reedsville. Nate is currently the VP of the American Peonies Society, and Solaris Farms has been featured in many television and magazine profiles as a destination for master gardeners, groups, and our specialty gardeners. So let's welcome Nate. Thank you. We'll try to do the best we can with the microphone. I, I see Jenny had that all figured out just perfectly. Stand still. <laughs> Stand still. There is a small cutout. Pin your arm against your chest. Yeah. Okay. All right, so th this evening we are going to take a look at daylilies kind of in depth and give you a little bit of information that either will shock you or you'll go, oh yeah, I knew that already. But <laughs> in, in any case, here we go. Daylilies are, are kind of one of our main staples on our farm. Um, we hybridize new varieties and grow a lot of other people's cultivars as well. Um, at this point in time, just, just to give you an idea, there's over 80,000 registered cultivars of daylilies. And that can reach from anywhere from about 1,500 to 2,000 new registrations every year. Are they all worthy? Probably not. But just to give you an idea of how many named things are out there, it's a lot. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of a background, um, Origins, daylilies belong to the genus Hemercalis, so that's the scientific name, meaning beauty for a day because each flower only lasts a day. Hopefully the plants produce a lot more than one day's flowers. Um, they're not closely related to true lilies, um, so the common name is deceptive. So when people come onto our farm and say, I want to see your lilies, I always have to ask them, do you want the true lilies or do you want the daylilies, which are, we should probably really just call hemercalis, but that befuddles a lot of people. Um, so what we're going to be looking at is the hybrids tonight. And that's what's most commonly available in the United States. These all originated from 19 species, plants that grew in the wild. They don't look anything like we, what we grow now. Most of them are yellow, little single-flowered things that are kind of insignificant. So it's kind of surprising what you'll see later all came from these darn yellow things. Um, this is one you may be familiar with, though. <laughs> so this is what a lot of people call the old red ditch lily, um, Hemercal Hemercalis fulva. And um, this is actually kind of a noxious weed, not noxious, but invasive. Let's put it that way. Um, and you really aren't supposed to plant it. If you have it, you, you really should get rid of it. Um, and they're hard to get rid of. Um, these are brought to the United States um, by immigrants, and they, pl they pack their plates and their chinaware in the root system, dried root systems and leaves. Well, of course, the root systems often contain pieces of the crown, and then along the wagon trails west, they would cast these off as they would unpack their dishes. And that's why you see them growing along roadways so commonly. Just to, there, there's many daylily hybridizers, but really the guy that got it all started was uh, Arlo Stout, and, uh, a New Yorker. 
and he, he hybridized a tremendous number of daylilies early on, and they're rather simple looking in comparison to what we see today, but he's the gentleman that got it started, and I won't even broach the number of other significant hybridizers that have come after him. There, there's a tremendous number. But if you ever see that name Stout, there's a, quite a few awards that are named after him. It, he's the guy. So if you are not familiar with the plant, um, they have a fleshy root system, um, kind of big tuberous roots that are, that are stored a lot of water. Um, so they, they're very drought resistant. They have a crown that sits on top of the root system. And that, that's the part that grows these fan or corn-like structures. And then they have a scape, which is the bloom stem. And the scape can have many branches on them or very few. And then the, the, the scape carries those flowers. And, and one flower per scape can be open or many, depending on, on the cultivar. And we like to go after those that have many flowers per stem or scape. So if you hear the word scape, that's a, that's a daylily term for bloom, bloom stem. And you'll hear that out of my mouth quite a bit tonight. So here we go. First thing, evergreen foliage versus dormant foliage. Now you might think, okay, dormant, we're in Wisconsin, that's probably a good thing, right? Go to sleep in the wintertime, it is a good thing, okay? Most of the daylily cultivars in the U.S. are hybridized in Georgia and Florida, and they grow evergreens very well, but they make them available for us in the north just because they're generous they don't do well for us. You may get away with growing them for a few years and then you get the wrong winter conditions and it knocks them out. Last winter and the winter before were extremely hard on daylily cultivars that were evergreen or had evergreen, evergreen tendencies. I have to find my sweet spot here. So anyway, how can you tell if you have evergreen or dormant daylilies? In the spring when they come up, if you take a look at my photos, very often the evergreens will come up with twisted foliage or foliage that looks like, like uh, cooked cabbage. Kind of yellow, um, very weak, insignificant. Um, the dormant daylilies will come up with nice triangular diamond shaped um, buds that will come up out of the ground and they'll be deep green in color. Um, that's, that's the first way to tell. The other way to tell is those that die are evergreens. <laughs> so, um, there's also on the market, in this, I, I really truly believe this is a marketing ploy. When you see the word semi evergreen, this was something that was probably invented by someone in the south thinking, I think I can sell my evergreens to people in the north. I'll just call them semi evergreen. In other words, they're not really evergreens, they're kind of halfway between a dormant and evergreen but they'll survive in the north. We found that most of those that are marketed that way are evergreen and they die. So, Now what does a dormant bud look like? If you were to dig up your daylilies at this time of year, which you would not want to do, you would find that the, the foliage is dying back. The evergreens may actually look quite green at this time of year, but the dormant ones will look kind of yellow and look like you're going to sleep. If you dig them up and you pull that foliage away, you're going to find bullet-shaped buds underneath the ground, kind of like what we have up here. You can see there's really no, there, there's a little bit of a yellow leaf sticking up there. That's the tip of that yellow bud. Um, these are dormant. They cap themselves off to water in the wintertime in that bullet form that they have. The evergreens will remain open and water can flow down into them and rupture cell tissue and crown tissue on them. So that's why dormant daylilies are so important for us. Okay, so you want to buy daylilies. I'm going to recommend that you go shopping in Wisconsin. Okay, your best bet, if you, if you want to know what you can grow well in Wisconsin, see it in somebody else's garden. Either that or be willing to take the, spend the bucks and take a chance of losing it. That, I have to do that. So, um, but maybe you don't have to. There's a lot of nice gardens around with a lot of nice daylilies. 
look for plants that have healthy, dormant foliage too. So if you tour somebody's garden, look at the, the plant's foliage to its leaves. If it has ratty looking foliage, you may not want that in your garden. It, doesn't, it, it won't be nice to look at in any event. So that's kind of a, a shopping tip that I like to give people. Look for strong scapes, things that aren't tipped over. Okay, that's a characteristic. It's probably not, you know, a single feature in a single year where it's just bad luck that it's tipping over. We have daylilies that every year they get they get into bloom, the flowers get heavy, and they lay on the ground. Okay, so you want things that stick up nice and straight, and they show off their flowers better. Um, well, branch scapes. If the scape has many branches on it, it's going to hold more flowers almost always, and it will have more than one flower open at a time, which gives you this nice bouquet effect. So things to look for in that, in that regard. And then high bud counts. If there are more buds on those scapes, you're going to have a longer bloom season. And you really should expect most of your daylilies to bloom for about three weeks now. The modern hybrids are that good. Take catalogs with a grain of salt. So what you're looking at up here is, this is the same plant, lake effect, named cultivar. And you can see the color differences in them quite easily. Okay, in fact, in Wisconsin, most of the time, lake effect looks muddier than that. A really muddy looking flower. On some days, it can be quite beautiful and quite clear. But the hybridizer knew that when they took a picture right here, that some days it can be crystal clear, and that's the way they market it. And that's what they're gonna put in the catalog. So they're gonna put the best picture in the catalog. You wanna look at many pictures on the internet is a wonderful thing to go look at, look at daylight -like flowers, and now you'll see a wide range. If you see consistent flowers from various gardens, then you know you probably hit the jackpot with that cultivar. Okay, purchasing, double fan or better. So when we talk about a fan, they make these corn stalk like growths, right? And the bigger the clump, the more fans or more corn stalks that are coming out of that, that, that plant. Um, it's best to buy double fans, two fans, or three fans or four fans if you can get them. Sometimes you can even get bigger clumps that's fine. If you get really large clumps, they need to be divided. Um, quite honestly, daylilies need to be reset, so not a good spot. <laughs> they need to be reset, so anything over four fans really needs to be divided, otherwise the plants pile up on themselves and they don't, they don't bloom as well, they don't grow as well. So that transplant's really important with a smaller plant. And this is, this is a big one for me. Most of us as gardeners really appreciate plants that are grown into a clump and have many, many stems and produce a nice rounded effect. If you can take a look at these things in bloom in a clump in somebody else's garden, do it, go for it. It's worth a million bucks as far as your plants go. Um, not all daylilies make nice clumps. Some of them look terrible in a clump. They have wonderful, beautiful single flowers, but in a clump, some of the most gorgeous flowers, they don't measure up. So a clump is really important to take a look at. Okay, three keys to, to growing these things really well. During bloom season, Give them as much water as you possibly can, okay? Um, those flowers are made up of 99% water, and if you don't give them enough water during bloom season, the flowers are much smaller. But if you water them, they balloon up and become big and voluptuous, okay? Um, and the plants like it, of course, too, okay? Now, they don't like to be in a bog or with wet feet, but they like to have moisture all the time.
And that can be a challenge in Wisconsin in July especially. Um, but it, it really will help your plants. Ample nutrition. Um, we were talking over here, Melorganite works wonders. And I, and I haven't tried worm castings just because they're too expensive, but I've heard that that's really good. So daylilies, they like a little food. If you can give it to them, do that. And then full sun. Um, you can plant, plant them in partial shade, but expect less flowers. More greenery, less flowers. Full sun, lots of flowers, good greenery. Soils and mulch. Okay, um, wood mulch is a wonderful thing for daylilies because it keeps their feet cool and it holds the moisture um, around the root system. And it, it really doesn't impact daylilies negatively as it decays like it does many other plants. They're rooted deeply enough that they can pull good nutrition from deeper in the ground, not in that zone that's depleted of nitrogen due to decaying wood mulch. Um, really good thing. So I recommend mulching. And it also saves on your back for weeding. So. Okay, winter care. This is a picture of our, uh, one of our fields in the winter a couple years ago. And it's not unusual for us to have total ice over our fields at certain parts of the winter. And dormant daylilies, they don't really seem to care a whole lot. Um, so winter protection is nice if you can give it to them with mulch because that will actually prevent that soil from thawing and taking on more water in the wintertime. But they can tolerate the icing if the gr ground isn't thawed too much below it. Last winter was really hard on daylilies because we had thawing going on in February and then it rained and it's super saturated to top at six inches of the soil. And that, that killed lots of things. Daylilies, yes, but trees and a lot of other perennials too had difficulties with those conditions. Pests and diseases. We're fortunate in Wisconsin, we live far enough north that we don't have to deal with this pest, which is hemicallus rust. And in the south, they have a huge problem with this. It's, it's a fungus that, that pro it, it propagates itself by feeding on the leaves. And then when it fruits out, it becomes kind of a, a rusty coating on the plants. Now, this, this disease can get mistaken for hemicallus leaf streak very easily. But leaf streak, you can run your fingers across it and not come up with anything on your fingers. But if you get hemicallus rust, you can rub your fingers on it and you'll have rust on your, your, your fingers. And this is very debilitating to plants. It weakens them. It doesn't kill them outright, but it makes them less productive. And sooner or later, it, they'll probably succumb to it. Um, the south has problems because it overwinters. Wisconsin, we get too cold and it knocks it out. There is fear, though, that this will mutate and become used to our conditions in the winter. I hope not. So. Um, I, I actually avoid buying things out of the south now because I don't want to see this in my garden. That's, that's it. So this is hemicallus leaf streak. And this often occurs right down the center line of the leaves, the midrib of the leaves. Um, and it looks like a dead spot. And it usually occurs earlier in the year. And then the, those damaged leaves die out and get replaced by better looking leaves in the summertime. It's a cool, wet condition loving disease. Um, and it really doesn't do much to our plants other than make them look a little ugly early on. So don't get upset if you see this. Some years it's bad, some years it's not. Spring sickness. Um, it's likely that many of us have seen this. When the plants first come out of the ground, you see sawtooth, the edges on the leaves, they bend and they twist. It looks like they might have been sprayed with something. Um, but it's, it's just spring sickness, and they found that it's caused by a mite that carries botrytis, another fungus on it, that, does, that actually affects the growing center, a growing point of the, the crown of the daylily, and they typically will grow out of that uh, malady as the summer goes on. But it can really weaken the plants, and some cultivars are um, very susceptible to it, others not so much. Um, I, any, any cultivars that I see, any name varieties that I see that have this, I usually just get them out of the garden and say, okay, that one's just not going to be really good for us, okay? 
And then, then of course, we have the biological pests, um, the deer, earwigs, rabbits, things like that. Um, controlling these are a real problem, and I know deer are getting to be a bigger problem, especially for you folks in the West Bend area. They become real problematic. Um, a shotgun, a dog, but there are deer spray sprays that can be used, uh, fencing, that kind of thing. But it, it's all expensive, is really what it is. And, and hopefully there can be some other uh, things done by our government entities to help us out in this regard. I don't know. Earwigs are just ugly. And they have a tendency to chew on the flowers, but they're, they have cycles of highs and lows over the years. So you may see hundreds of them one year, and then the next year not see a, a one. Okay, and last year they were at a big, big time low. So we didn't even see any of these on the farm. Um, just cleaning up in the garden in the fall helps get rid of earwigs, but they're not, they're not really a health issue for the plant. They're just disgusting. Okay. All right, so we get to look at some nice favorable cultivars for our conditions now, and hopefully you'll like what I put together. If not, <laughs> go shopping. There's 80,000 to choose from. <laughs> Okay, th this is a favorite of mine, Accidental Tourist. Um, relatively inexpensive now. Um, a few years back, it was quite expensive. Um, yes, and you all, everybody has a handout tonight, and there is a ton of information in there. Okay, and I'm not gonna go through every little bit and piece of it. But uh, Accidental Tourist is wonderful. It has kind of frosted looking flowers. And they can change from day to day, but it's always beautiful, and it's a high-performance plant, easy to grow. Alaskan boughs, so this is one of our cultivars. And it's, it's a beautiful kind of creamy white with yellow edges, um, if you like the edges. But here again, this plant isn't the best plant in a clump. It's more of a show flower, and it is quite showy. It'll stick out in your garden. But it's, it's not a plant that you're going to expect to see this big clump with all these beautiful flowers on it. Okay, just so keep that in mind. Um, All-American Chief. This is an award winner by the American Hemercalis Society. Um, beautiful showy red flowers with that big yellow throat. Angel's Realm. This was bred by Brother Charles Recamp. And this is an older cultivar but it has stood the test of time. It is beautiful, it has excellent plant habits, it looks outstanding in a clump. Um, the sun doesn't beat it up, it's just, it's just superior. Nate? Yes? What is the asterisk next to it? That means it's a tetraploid, okay? okay? And if we wanna deal with tetraploid, diploid, we're all diploid sitting in here right now, at least I think we are. Okay, so that, that means we have pairs of chromosomes, okay? A tetraploid has doubled pairs of chromosomes, and that's quite common in the plant world. And that can, be, that can occur naturally or through um, human manipulation. And most of these have been human manipulation things with the, with the tetraploids. Um, why is that important if you're breeding daylilies? Tetraploids breed best with te other tetraploids. Diploids best with other diploids. Okay. And if you think that's a bunch of gobbledygook, most of the uh, strawberries that you eat are hexaploids or better. So it's double, 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 double chromosomes. <laughs> so they're really, so if you looked at inner nuclei in the cells, you'd see lots of extra sets of chromosomes on, on many plants. That's, that's much of an oversimplification, but it'll get us there. Okay, so this is an ankle biter. This is a diploid, okay? Um, little flowers on this guy, and ankle biter, it's appropriately na named because it's a real short little plant. It'll bite you in the ankles. Um, some of these small flowered things are really interesting because we, we see so many of the large flowered varieties. It's nice to have a little variety in our lives. Ardent Amur, a beautiful red with a green throat. Armed Azerbaijanis, I, this is not my hybrid, <laughs> or nor my name. 
<laughs> so anyway, um, this is a wonderful red though. It's nice and tall, and this looks great in a clump. And you can see all of those extra um, branches on the scapes too. So this has a very long bloom season. Now, if you're into doubles, there's some really neat doubles starting to pop up. Aztec King is one of them. Um, and this, this actually has very nicely branched scapes. This is a good thing as well. Not easy to find, but it's, it's a good one. And quite happy in Wisconsin. How much is something like that? Huh? Aztec King usually is right around $15 to $18 for a double fan. Bang Bang. This is one of ours. Um, this has actually gotten quite a bit of national attention. It's the first daylily I've, I've hybridized that got a lot of national attention. And, and I really don't push my daylilies a whole lot. So I, I, I was kind of surprised. But the people in the Kansas City area really like this one. And they have dry summers. And it seems to really do well for them down there. Um, does really well for me up here, too. This looks fantastic in a clump. Always in high demand. Buku bouquet, and this one blooms in bouquets. So this is a, quite a stunner um, for lots of flowers per scape, but also as a clump. And it's, it's a red, and if you grow red daylilies, very oftentimes if you grow them in the sun, the sun causes them to bleed or fade out very quickly. This one holds its color, because it's more of a pink red. So this one's got some real uh, bonuses going for it. And this is Bromance, um, very, very large flowers, seven, seven and a half inch flowers. Um, really stunning, showy plant. Brown Witch, if you like brown, there are brown daylilies, okay. And this one actually is pretty brown. Um, I'm not a big fan of it, but I'll tell you what, it sells out of my garden every year, so it, it, people must like it. Busted, um, quite a vibrant yellow with kind of a really pinkish red eye, um, quite a stunner. And it's got a little red edge all the way around it too, so they're quite nice. Butterscotch smoothie is one of my favorites. Um, it's, it's kind of a butterscotch color that's got this, this bronzy glaze over it. Um, there are a few other cultivars that are similar to this, but they always are spotty. This one doesn't have spotty flowers. This one has really nice uniform flowers, so um, very much like this. Um, catastrophic events is an odd flower that can look different from uh, <laughs> day to day. Obviously, if you look, I'm going to see if I can get this to work for me. No. Yes, here we go. So this is the same flower on, or same plant on different days, and you can see it's quite different, and it can be even quite different than that. The, the petals can twist and curl. Um, it's a large flower, but quite good. Um, we have a number of the plants that we uh, have in a, we, in a weasel kind of series. Um, cheddar weasel, they tend to be smaller flowers, um, beautiful little plants that have that carry an abundance of flowers. Um, highly recommended. Cold, sho cold shoulder. Try a different spot. There we go. Cold shoulder. So this is a real cool pink color. Um, and this is a wonderfully hardy plant, and it looks outstanding in a clump, too. Maybe not the fanciest flower, but you see it because it's got such good clump value. And then deregulated um, behavior is probably one of the brightest flowers that I grow. Um, and this has become very popular with people too. It's got that little edge around it. It's quite a contrasty flower and a fast grower, very productive. Dragon pinata, another big favorite. And look at the buds on that. You get, this is what I'm talking about. When I say buds, this is what you want to look for. This is Firewire, another heavily budded cultivar, another diploid. Fliver. This is one that blooms multiple flowers per day. So this, this is the heaviest blooming 
daylily that I own or hybridized. Um, it, it's nothing on a clump to see 100 or more flowers open per day. So really, really good stuff. Heavenly Dragonfire. For people that like orange, this is pretty darn good. Heavenly Uni United We Stand. This was introduced just a few years ago. It's a very good grower. And I think it just won the top award in the American Hemercalis Society, which is a stout award. Um, and it does very well up here. Um, very, very beautiful, big, bright red flowers. High watermark. So that white eye that you see in there, that white center, they, they often, if that's really light colored, like a lighter color of the petals, which it is, it's kind of a lavender color, they call that a watermark. So that's where that name comes from. This is very good too. Honey on my lips. I have nothing bad to say about it. It's just a very beautiful kind of soft honey colored flower. Incredible bulk. This is a plant we hybridized, probably introduced maybe 10 years ago, and it's still selling for 75 bucks a plant. And I can't get the price down because people keep walking out of the garden with it for 75 bucks, and it grows really well. I'm not going to get rich, you know, doing this, but that if that plant, it 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 sells. And so. Um, Hybridizers love it though because it has it is the hybridizers that have been buying it quite honestly um, It's got lots of buds Huge branches big flowers hardy plant excellent foliage. It's kind of the whole whole ball game and it makes in its kids look good, too So that's the reason um, So this is a really funny name <laughs> Juicy bubble butt so the story behind this is my, my son, my son, Ethan, um, as he was growing up, he would uh, run away from his sister and just yell at her, Emma, you're just a juicy bubble butt, as an insult, you know, a little boy thing. So anyway, we thought we'd put that on a daylily for a name, probably a little offensive. But uh, in, in any event, it's kind of a bubblegum color, colored flower. And it blooms quite late. Very often we close. We close right around August 15th every year, the farm does. And this thing isn't in bloom until like August 16th or 17th. So <laughs> people don't often get to see it. But it's a really pretty flower and a nice plant. Keep it clean. And this actually kind of has a double meaning. We have a gal that works for us that everything's kind of a little bit on the edge. <laughs> And we have to say, keep it clean, come on. And so we named this for her. But this is a very, it's a very clean looking flower too on top of it. Um, so an oldie but a goodie, the lemon lily, which was, this came along with the settlers as well as packing material. But this one's not a weed and it smells wonderful. It's got that lemony smell and it blooms in May which is a really early bloomer, and it blooms profusely, as you can see. Okay, and it will take a very damp, wet area very well, which I kind of like, because they got one spot in my field that's a little boggy, and that's where this one goes and grows. So, quite excellent. Liberal thinking. So this is, this is one of the nice ruffled things. But I'll tell you what, if you've got a garden, and you want flower power, and you want people, you want to walk out in your yard and go, oh, look at that beautiful clump, look at that. These things that have these wonderful, roughly little edges, they don't show up in the garden unless you walk up to them and admire, the, admire them individually, okay? Now, I love this. This is one of ours. This is very good. But you're not going to see it from a mile away. This one, you will. <laughs> so this is kind of a shocking pinkish lavender. And this is called Lunker, and the reason it's called Lunker is the scapes, the stems that hold the flowers, are huge. Very often at the base, they're more than an inch and a half across, yes. And they carry these big, so we're in deer season now, you got these big antler-like, well, you can see the, the branches sticking out on it. They're huge, and it stands about chest high on me. So it's, it's a big thing. So if you want something that's really, uh, you know, a knockout deal, that's one of them. 
The funny part is we like to use this in hybridizing, but it's so dominant, all of its kids kind of look like it. So you don't get anything different. And then there's always the little doubles, microburst. So this is only about 12, 15 inches in height. And little popcorn doubles, really cute. Minion, this was uh, developed by Arlo Stout. Um, so the, the originator, originator of, of the hybrid daylily in, in the United States. And this is a wonderful accent plant. The flowers are carried on very, very skinny scapes, tiny, thin stems, and they blow around in the wind. It's really gorgeous. Excellent accent plant. And then there's morning chatter, and there is a lot of chatter with this thing. This thing is just all over the place, lots of flowers. And you can see it as a clump. That's one plant that's like three years old. It grows really fast. Um, really excellent. Okay, mystery being written. This is another big plant about chest high once it gets to its uh, adulthood. Um, quite an interesting plant because it's a bicolor. And then as you go, you're probably wondering, Nate, why did you put that in there? Well, Notify Ground Crew is one of these six-foot deals, okay? So it's, you, you walk up to it, you'll be looking it in the face. But it's a nocturnal bloomer. So at night, the flowers are open. So when I take a picture of this, you can see the partially open flower there. That's going to open up at night, okay? And it, was, it, it comes from a species called Altissima, which is pollinated by a night moth. So it makes sense. Omomuki, if you like really nice bright yellow colored flowers, this is a this is a good one. Orchid elegance. It's got that kind of bluey lavender eye. Quite quite stunning. And then Paul Voth. Um, typically a rather inexpensive uh, plant developed by uh, Dr. Griesbach out of Madison, who's known for producing Lilium, the, the, the Oreo pets. But he also did some uh, daylily hybridizing, and he produced very many nice, nice, good performing plants that have excellent color. And Paul Voth is just a standout in that regard. Easy to grow, beautiful clumps, just, just outstanding. Point of divergence is one of our favorites, but it's funny. This plant in our sales field gets walked by very often and it's not terribly expensive. And I haven't figured out exactly what it is, but I think it's one of those plants that there are other things around it that are much brighter. And uh, it just has to be the right kind of person that wants to buy it, I guess. It would be me. And then there's Pristine Christine. Um, just a beautiful, would we call that a lavender color? Lavender violet, um, very, very good performing plant. Primal Scream, this is another award winner. It's an orange, um, but it's a, it's a really brilliant, bright, violent orange. Purity, now this is another old cultivar that stands quite tall, about four feet or better sometimes. Um, smaller flowers, but the stems are skinny again and they wave around in the wind. But the, the flowers are not, they're not as small as Minion, which is uh, like three inches. These are more like in the four and a half to five inch range. So they're, they're a nicer flower. Not, another nice accent plant though, in my opinion. Um, this is not commonly available. Easy to grow raspberry squirrel. Um, I really like this as an accent plant. And look at the scapes on this one as well. Or they're just out of this world with these big, long side branches that stick out. Um, that's quite an exceptional plant. It just hasn't been well distributed. Reagan Kate, developed by another, by another uh, hybridizer in the state of Wisconsin, Philip Korth, um, who's now retired from that business. He did many nice things. Um, excellent plant habits there. Another uh, hybridized plant from Wisconsin by um, Jay Downs out of Plover, Red Lover. Um, 
beautiful, beautiful plants with gorgeous flowers. Ready Freddy. And this is one of those more spidery, narrow petal formed deals. Um, but it's got that really nice big yellow throat um, with brilliant red um, petals. Um, quite good. Rock solid. And I never could figure this plant out. This is another one that goes flying off the property. Yet when I look at the plant, I see kind of yellowish foliage. It's not as nice as a lot of the other ones. But there's something about that. Everybody's eye is trained a little bit differently. So I haven't got this one worked out because uh, people just love this. But it's a really nice plant to grow in Wisconsin. It, it does very well. Scottish Fantasy. And seems like I never have this around. This, this, this always goes off because of its soft coral colors. It's, it's a really good thing. And then there's Scratch My Itch. Um, we stumbled on this a few years, well, quite a few years ago. This was, this was an earlier registration of mine. Um, it's one of the heaviest blooming plants um, that we have. And you can see the number of flowers, and the, the, the entire plant gets covered with flowers. You don't see much for foliage very often. That's how, that's how much of a flower it is. Deadheading it, the, you know, yesterday's flowers is no fun. It's, it, there's just too many, but it's, it's impressive. Seven Deadly Sins, and it's just sinfully, softly beautiful. Sears Tower. So this gets five and a half to six feet, six feet in height. Um, so this is another big one. It takes it about three years to get to that height. The first year it's three foot range, next year it's four foot, and then it finally gets up in its third year. Impressive flowers, six and a half to seven inch flowers. People love it. Um, and it doesn't tip over at that height, it's, it's a pretty good thing. And then Speaker of the Louse, well, we just had our elections, okay. <laughs> so this is Speaker of the Louse, just good performing orange with all the rest of our plants in the background. Sundog, so this is a little round flower, that's a cutie. Um, it's another diploid. Tiger eye spider. Torpedo blast. This is another one that's a heavy, heavy bloomer. Big flower. The scapes lean a little bit, but they don't lay on the ground. Um, it's, it's, it's quite impressive. Veronica's vanity. There's a really nice ruffled up red. Virtuosity. This, this is a wonderful plant in Wisconsin. Wide Awake. So this was produced by Brother Charles Recamp, introduced by Roy Clem. Um, it's been a slow grower, but it's productive, and it's just beautiful. Okay, getting close to the end here. So. You've got daylily clumps, and we talked earlier about you get this big clump, you start to see your plants maybe not bloom as much. It's probably because it's all of the fans are all grown on top of one another, and those roots can't get out into the native soil and absorb as much energy as, as they should. It's time to divide. Okay, so if you do see that happen, dig it all up, hose out all of the soil. Break apart all your fans. You can get your fingers in there, or you can just cut it with a knife. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, and you'll get a, get a bunch of divisions. Um, best to try to go for two or three fan divisions if you can. That's, that's three. They're connected. Okay. And then always trim the foliage back. And this is the one that always baffles people when they come to the farm. They'll see rows of plants, and they're all cut down to about eight inches. And they can tell it. They, they've been planted. They go, why do you cut the leaves down on it? Aren't you weakening them? And, and the honest answer is, what we're doing is we're taking away their ability to evaporate more water out of their root system by removing the foliage. And that also causes the plants to send out new roots. So it's a stimulator 
in in a regard in that regard. So whenever you transplant a daylily, cut the foliage off. It will help the plant overall. And then I, I wanted to just end with some of the newer cultivars that are out there. And I don't know if these are, these aren't necessarily the newest things, but they're the newest things that are in our garden that were really good, okay? Um, there's a hybridizer out of Ohio named James Gossard, and he's produced quite a few new things lately that have been very good. Not all are hardy, so we've we actually been buying his collections and testing them up here. And, and about 50% of them are really good which is pretty good, because Wisconsin's quite a bit different than Ohio is. You'd think it would be similar, but not that much. So um, some of these things that were, were very good were uh, Chevron Summer, Blown Away was actually produced by Phil Korth out of Wisconsin. Black Raven is a huge winner. That thing is outstanding. People love it. And then Feast of Victory has been excellent as well. So we're starting to see some of these fancier form flowers, but once again, the fancy form flowers don't show up from a distance in the garden as being all that interesting. Leo Bordelow is a huge fancy flower um, of yellow kind of gold color, um, outstanding. Pixie Dragon, so that, that's kind of a funny looking little flower, but uh, it's carried in multitudes of flowers per stem. Noticing you, noticing me, um, wonderful lavender flower. And then red nova is another one of those reds. As many red daylilies as we have, you'd think there wouldn't be some that would be better than others, but there are some that are noticeably better, and red nova is one of them. And then we go to some more lavender colored ones. Stupid in love is one, that's a great name, but the flower is outstanding too. And this is when you walk into the garden and you see that and you go, oh boy, wow, what a beauty. Blue-throated hummingbird is just, just a beautiful color. I don't think I'd characterize it as blue, but it's beautiful. Strawberry lemonade produces huge amounts of flowers. And then cold and clear is um, one of our more recent introductions down here at the bottom right. Um, and this is one that uh, I have to admit, I didn't think I had it priced at 100 bucks a fan. And I had 10 fans the first year I introduced it. And I thought, no way I'll sell one or two of these. Well, shoot. <laughs> Every one of them, out the door. I shouldn't complain, but then that means it takes me that much longer to build up stock again. And I was planning on, on building stock. So that actually turned out better that actually has looked better in years after registration than the year I registered it, which is really interesting because very often times you register things and they, they're just kind of like, eh, it's the same as it's always been. That one's just gotten better, and I don't know why, but uh, it's been very good. So this is our gardens in the summertime. You're all welcome to come up and visit. We're an American Hemerkala Society display garden, which means you can come on site, and if you don't want to buy anything, you don't have to. And, and that's great. We've got picnic tables for you to eat at. Enjoy the day. If you are shopping, plan on spending at least two hours because there's a lot of plants to look at. Okay? Uh, and um, it's just fun to look. But you're always welcome. All right, so don't, don't feel uh, like you have to, you're obligated to buy. We do have clematis, clematis, and we also have martigan lilies in pots and lots of other lilium as well. So um, we kind of expanded in those areas. How many acres do you have? Well, we've got 20 acres, part of it's in alfalfa. So it's about seven acres in nursery stock. Um, it's about, an acre and a half to two acres in, in daylilies, and they're planted tight. So they're, they're in rows, everything's labeled. You'll, you'll have no problems identifying things. We did a major reorganization a year or two ago, so um, I think you'll really enjoy it. I don't, I don't hear people going, oh, I wish I hadn't come here, so, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm at that point where if we have any questions, I'd be glad to entertain those. Yes, ma'am. 
The rebloomers. You notice they didn't mention that. So her question is, what about the rebloomers? Well, in Wisconsin, reblooming as far north as we are, most don't. Okay, we just have too short a growing season for those. Um, we're used to Stella de Oros, um, the little yellow ones that are planted, and you see those rebloom. There's a couple other varieties that do all right in Wisconsin, but for the most part, they don't. We just need to move down to northern Illinois to really start experiencing the rebloomers. We just don't have the day length, the growing degree days for those. It's going <laughs> to. He said, wait for the climate to catch us, yes. <laughs> it seems like it's going to. Any other questions? Okay, so her question is, she has some new day lilies, new to that. Okay, and they are day lilies, they're not lilies. Well, you know what, I don't know. Hold it, okay. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll assume they're day lilies, all right. Um, and the question is, when do I deadhead them? In other words, take the scapes off and put, put everything to the ground and clean them up, okay? So... Um, people go at this a number of different ways. Um, find my spot again. Okay, there we go. Um, people will go every day and remove the day before his flowers. That's, that's deadheading the old blooms. And that's, that's just a tidying up feature. It doesn't matter if they hang there or stay there. Okay. Um, but a lot of people like to clean up their gardens on a daily basis and just remove the old old dead flowers. Okay, I don't do that because there's too many to do, so I just ignore it. Okay, but if you have a few plants, that might work for you. But now, cleanup wise, if you have plants that are done flowering completely, you can go down and you can cut that old stem away and get that out of the garden. Okay, no damage done. Don't cut the foliage down though, the green, the green leaves, until fall when they start to go yellow. Then you can cut them off, but not until they start to go yellow because they're still taking in energy and dropping it in their root system and storing it for next year. If you cut them down too early, you'll have a lesser plant the following year. Does that make sense? And did I answer your question? Yes, I Good. Are you ever going to do a talk on the peonies or your Asiatic lilies? Question is, am I ever going to do a talk on my peonies or the Asiatic lilies? I can, I just have to be asked. <laughs> How many peonies do you have like up on your farm? When you have a huge area? I saw some, I think, on... Uh... So, so the question is about peonies overall at the farm. So we, we have a number of different types um, and tree peonies, which aren't really trees, they're kind of small bushes or shrubs in Wisconsin. Um, I hybridize those and then the herbaceous type, which die to the ground every year. Um, so we have both of those kind and we have, we have a good five or more acres in of those at this point. And that's been a growing thing. I will have about a week this spring coming up that I will post on the website when we'll be open that you can come on the farm and visit any time during that week. Yeah, if, if you're interested, okay? And hopefully Mother Nature will cooperate. That's, that's a fun time. If you've never seen tree peonies, they're cool. I still love them. I've seen them for years and I just can't wait. So um, if, you, if you're interested in those, that, yeah. that's great. Yeah, great. And I do quite a bit of peony talking throughout the state and the U.S. So if it isn't for you guys, maybe you can catch me at another venue. Okay. Yes. Okay, so they're herbaceous peonies. They die to the ground every year. 
you should really get that foliage out of there, the stems out of there, as soon as you possibly can. You don't want that stuff to drop back down on the surface of the ground. Um, what happens is those, those get leaf diseases and then they transfer to the crown and then that following year is growth. And a lot of people wait till spring, but the problem is now all the leaves have dropped on the ground and you gotta pick them out of there and that's no fun. So um, remove that stuff as soon as you possibly can. And those can be cut off flush with the ground. You, have to, you don't need to leave any stem. All of the new eyes are below the ground, okay? Um, and that's what I just spent my last week and a half doing is cutting all of those in the field. And it, I know it's no fun, but it's worth it. <laughs> so. You know what, with peonies, if they aren't looking any worse for the wear, don't fertilize. And always stay away from high nitrogen fertilizers with the peonies. Um, peonies do very well once they're established. Fertilization is usually seldom an issue unless you live on very sandy soil that has low nutrition. Um, eastern part of Wisconsin, we are like perfect peony soil for nutrition wise. So, anyone else? So, I have a tree peony that I've been waiting three years to grow. Does it take a while? I mean, it's getting bigger. But it What's the name on it, Tina? What's the name? So, she, she's, she's saying I've got a tree peony I've had for three years and it's not produced bloom yet. No, it's getting bigger, but it's. Did you get it from me? I don't I think so. I can't give us three years ago. I got real cool. Okay. But, but does that, will it take time? I mean. Yes, they, they take, they take time. Um, is it, how, how high is it this year? It's about this big. Okay. It's looking nice. It, I would think it would bloom this next year. Okay. Um, is it in full sun? Well, that's. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it, oftentimes we see that with uh, people that have failure to bloom on their peonies is they're competing root competition with trees, too much shade, or they're planted in not perfect soil for them, some other issue. And they're not really picky, they just, they need to have sun and they don't like root competition. So, um, and the worst offending, yes you can move it, but don't do it until fall. Yeah. Peonies, you know, September is really good time to transplant peonies in Wisconsin. Okay. Any other time is you're you're kind of taking your chances. To, you might kill them. Okay. So. Do you give gift certificates? Yes, you can buy those on our website. Anyone else? When is the best time in is it July to come and look at the blooming? Yeah, the daylilies um, will be in bloom usually the second week of July all the way till August 1st. That's the peak, those two weeks, okay? Um, after that, you get some late bloomers. Before that, you might get a few early bloomers, but that's when you're gonna see the most. So, second week. And one more question. A friend of mine gave me like a couple weeks ago just the roots, a whole bunch of roots of daylilies, and I didn't get to plant them yet. Can I leave them like till spring, or do I really have to get them the ground yet? You're going to want to bury the roots, heal them at least. You wouldn't have to divide them or do anything, but just dig a hole and drop them in and cover them up. Okay. okay? And then you can deal with them in the spring. I would not do that. Okay. I would dig a hole, get them below the ground. Okay? okay? okay. So, yes? When you see a day lily, do you know its name? <laughs> so the question is, when, do, when I see a day lily, do I know its name? Uh, some I can recognize, but there's a lot of them. No. Yeah, with 80,000 of them out there, I've not even seen close to half of them. So it's just, yeah. I, but I would, be, I would be able to recognize those, yes, I would. So, um, it, it, you know, if you haven't ever done it before, shopping for daylilies in somebody's field doesn't have to be mine. I don't care who it is. But shopping for daylilies in a field is just a blast. It, it, it's a killer. It, it really is. Because you get to see the plant growing in the ground, and you may have seen pictures and think that's the most wonderful thing you, you've ever seen, and then you see it in the field and go, yuck, and you look at the next one and go, I want that one. 
it really, you, you really get to see what the plant is all about, and, it, and it's just, it's an awful lot of fun. So if you get that chance to do that, and there are a number of places around that have field operations, um, so, you know, make use of that if you can do it. Or friends' gardens. I will yeah. share one more thing. My blood people up north, the deer get their plants. Instead of using liquid fence, which is expensive, they mix Mongolian fire oil with water and use as a spray. And you buy it in the Chinese food section of grocery stores. They don't always have it here, but up north they have it. It's like a little A1 sauce bottle, like size like that. One tablespoon of Mongolian fire oil to one quart of water. So the, I, I take it that's some kind of pepper oil, huh? Probably. Is that so? Rain on plant, just like liquid fence. Of course, the rain will wash it off. You have to respray it. That's a lot cheaper, and they use it all over up north and all kinds of things. So, like so the moral of the story is deer problems, Mongolian fire oil. Okay. Okay, this will be our last question. Yes. Um, I just would like to put a plug in for our labyrinth garden because we have over a hundred different varieties of daylilies, and you can see them in bloom when they're blooming, like Nate said, in July. So we have some of them from here, not all of them. I have some other ones that. Um, our, but we try to have a lot of um, daylilies from Wisconsin hybridizers. So and they're labeled, so yes, because we are a daylily display garden, so they have to be labeled. Yeah, as, as much as you say that, Barb, um, thank you for dinner, by the way. It was really good. <laughs> um, the Wisconsin hybridized plants, interestingly enough, actually are the best plants in my gardens too. And I'm not talking about my own either. I'm talking about Phil Korth and Rod Lysine and, um, oh geez, Jim uh, up in Foxwood Gardens. There's a whole bunch of kind of smaller hybridizers in the state and they produce plants that really grow well for us. So they are really regional plants in a lot of cases. So if you can if you can nick those off, find those little gems. They really they do better. They really do. I, I wouldn't have thought so, but they do. So um, well, anyway, I want to thank everybody, and hopefully you got some morsel of information that you like. Daylilies are pretty. You know, we see those around a lot. So I, I don't know how much more there is to tell you, um, but I enjoyed it, and uh, hope to see some of you this summer. It would be fun to just show you around, if nothing else, and you say, hey, Nate, I saw you last year. Can you show me around? And if I'm not too busy, I will do that. So um, thank you very much. Right. Have a good winter. Thank you very much, Nate. Thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you next year at one of our first seminars in March. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Schedule will come out in April. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.